Hello and welcome to this episode of Boundless Body Radio. I am your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have a very special guest and a dear friend of mine. Let's introduce him here. John Cottrell is originally from Oakland, California, and now resides in Salt Lake City, Utah. John is formally educated in clinical psychology, having earned a Master of Science and PhD from Pacific Graduate School of Psychology in Palo Alto, California. John moved to Salt Lake City in 1994 for his clinical psychology internship with Valley Mental Health. There he gained a broad range of experience, including child and adolescent psychotherapy, drug and alcohol treatment, psychological and neurophysiological testing, and group and couple therapy. John has always been fascinated with fitness and became devoted to this lifestyle in 1999. While still working as a psychotherapist, John taught fitness classes ranging from weightlifting to hip hop dance aerobics in the gym. John added yoga to his fitness routine in the year 2000. He has been able to use his education in psychology and devotion to fitness and yoga to understand and offer the benefits of a mind and body connection. As a certified yoga instructor, personal trainer, and sports nutritionist, John offers a variety of ways to, to create healthy living. He now teaches and, and co-manages at 21st Yoga in Salt Lake City. John also started his own business, Embody, and in 2008 offers yoga therapy as a certified yoga therapist, nutrition coaching, personal training, private and group lessons, workshops, and retreats. Embody also offers its men's yoga clothing line designed by John and marketed successfully to studios on a national level. John's latest venture has been in writing. He just self-published his second book, Some More Yoga, Please. It's a compilation of yoga articles that he has been writing. It complements his first book entitled Yoga with Intention, A Yogic Life Journey from Awareness to Honoring. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Casey. It's great to be here with you. This is wonderful. Thank you for officially ruining this show from the very beginning. Um, I don't know who else I could possibly invite that would have any kind of resume that even touches yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm humbled. Thank you. <laughs> you are <laughs> you're going to be our first guest and probably our last because of that. But hey, uh, I think <laughs> it was a good run while it lasted. Right on. <laughs> um, before we get going, uh, I have to just bring up, you and I seem to have a mild obsession with the play Hamilton. Can you tell me how that started for you? Oh my gosh. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably more than a mild obsession, right? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, gosh, well, it came out a few years ago, right? And I remember just all the hype around it and wanting to see it. And of course, you know, no one could get tickets, you know, not, you know, regular people. <laughs> um, but um, someone, someone just turned me on to the music. Someone said, get the soundtrack. I was like, okay, that's a good idea. And oh my gosh, um, what an amazing soundtrack. And that's what got me hooked. And I just, I think I, I don't know how many times I list, listened to it all the way through. And of course, there's songs that just, you know, touched me and, and motivated me and inspired me, but just the craft, you know, and the, uh, the uniqueness about this whole production is just, just quite re remarkable. And of course, we, we've seen the result of it, right? And, um, but it was really, it was the music that really got me going with it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, for me, I didn't ever get to watch the live play. Um, I was definitely anticipating it when it came out on Disney Plus. And yes. I watched it that first night. And I, I saw the first song and I was like, okay, you know, not bad. And then the second song, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is like pretty good. I think I'll keep watching. And by the third song, I was like, this is incredible. This is amazing. It's true. So was that the first time you saw it and heard the music? First time I saw it, first time I heard the music. Oh my gosh. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had and no I idea what the hype was about. I, and I think a lot of people had that kind of reaction. Like they, they kind of, they knew about the show, but had never seen it, never listened to the music. But once they just saw even just small clips of it, you know, oh, yeah. and you know, from the move, from the movie on Disney plus, man, people were instantly, you know, you know, drawn in. It, it really does pull you in. And it's an, a, it's a great history lesson. It, it really is. They do a really great job teaching that history part along with making um, just such a captivating show to watch, to listen to. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Everything I'd heard about it before then was like, this is about the founding fathers and they rap. I was like, okay, that's 
Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, and they want five hundred dollars a ticket to go see it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Um, okay, so tell me, um, how did you decide that you wanted to get into um, psychology? Gosh, um, you know, psychology was something that I, I guess was always on my mind, even as a kid, you know, as a preteen. But I think I kind of declared, I can remember declaring that I wanted to be wanted to become a psychologist probably sometime in early high school. And I remember someone asking me, so, so what do you want to do? Um, I said, I want to be able, I want to become a psychologist because I want to work with people. And that was, that was all I really knew. And that's all I really said. I, but I think the main part of that was I wanted to work with people. Um, and, and, and for some reason, psychology was the direction that stuck with me, even though I didn't really know a whole lot about it. And and so that's what I pursued. You know, when I went to college, you know, I, I think I declared my major, you know, day one. And I just, that's what I pursued. But but it, but as I look back on it, it still is a lot of question marks. I really don't know how I was really inspired by wanting to become a psychologist because I didn't know any psychologist. I don't come from, you know, a, you know, a family that 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 did that at all. So so, but that's, that's the path that I took and it, it's, it's, it's fit me quite well. Wow. Um, so in my mind, I think of psychology as, um, I guess more Western. And then I think of yoga as something that's more Eastern. And oftentimes those things don't really mix very well. So how did you get into yoga and how did you combine those two things together? Well, I think you're right. You know, as far as psychology, it's, it's a very Western approach to, you know, treatment and working with people where um, Eastern medicine um, has a has a different approach. And, and yoga certainly is a is an Eastern medicine, I guess you can say. And 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 just like psychology in my early days, I really I didn't know much about it. But with yoga, I didn't know much about yoga at all. Um, but I was very. Um, active, I guess, in regards to, um, you know, er, in my early days, grammar school, high school, college, I performed. I was a dancer, you know, I, I took some dance classes, I liked acting and singing and things like that. And, and I got into fitness, you know, just especially like aerobics and stuff like that. Um, and so when I was in Salt Lake City, when I moved to Salt Lake City, I I wanted to continue doing that in some regard. And so I joined a small gym and was taking some classes and having a good time. And I ended up getting a job actually as a uh, fitness instructor. And, and then this little gym started offering yoga. And because I had, you know, heard very little about it, but it seemed interesting enough and this gym was offering it, I thought, well, let's give it a try. And so I took the class and was instantly um, uh, just astounded by it. I fell in love with the practice and, and here's why, because what it did for me, it, it reminded me of movement and dance. Cause that's what I was doing, you know, already it had a fitness approach to it. And I was certainly into fitness and, and, I, and that's what, that was the initial attraction because I got to move my body and I was moving my body in a very different way. Cause it wasn't dance. It wasn't aerobics. This was very different, but I liked it. But the more that I did it, the more that I did it, um, I realized this isn't just changing my physical body because I certainly got more flexible, got a little stronger, things like that. But it was also changing me emotionally and, and mentally. And, and it reminded me a lot about psychology and what I was learning and, and doing as a psychologist at the time. And so those, that's kind of the initial connection that I made. It's like, hmm, it made me just wonder and think about, huh, there's something to this yoga thing. <laughs> and, and it seems to have a relationship with, with psychology. And that's as about as far as I took it at, in those early days. Wow. So you were the one who introduced me to yoga in 2007. And so you only found yoga in the year 2000, meaning you'd only had seven years experience when you introduced me to the practice. That's incredible. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Cause I had practiced for about a year from 1999 to about 2000, something like that. 
And um, after about a year or so of personal practice, I was I took a teacher training and learned how to become an instructor. It was very basic, however, at that time. Um, but yeah, by the time I was at uh, at at the health facility, um, yeah, I was teaching yoga for you know six or seven years. So when did you move to India, and how long were you there to learn the craft of teaching yoga? <laughs> well, that's funny <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I thought. That's what I thought yoga was. Or that's how I thought one became an instructor because some, you know, people would come up to me while I was, you know, taking classes like, John, you should become an instructor. I'm like, how do you become an instructor? Don't you have to go to India to, <laughs> to become an instructor? And they're like, no, <laughs> they have trainings here in the United States, <laughs> right here in Salt Lake City. Like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, you are a natural. It seems like you have this gift of letting life find you versus going out and seeking and forcing your way through life. It seems like some of these things you've already talked about were just allowed to find you. Well, I, th I think you're right. You know, as I look back and there's, and there's a long path to follow. And as, as I look back, it, I think it was that there was just, there was certainly indicators in my life and, and, and certainly prominent moments in my life that have, that were like stepping stones, I would say that brought me to this present moment. And, and, and I had, to, and I treated them like stepping stones. I didn't just get on that stone and stop, you know, and just stay there like at, with psychology or staying in California, for example, like that was the, it was, there was always the next step you know, what's, what's next. And I think I've always been like that, um, that this was just, you know, the training grounds for whatever, whatever I was doing at the time, it was kind of like the training grounds for what was to come next. And it was always a pleasant surprise of what was next. Cause it was usually things that I, it was, it was always things that I loved or, or eventually fell in love with. That's amazing. I think that's such a wise life lesson. And it's a perfect segue to another, I think, amazing life lesson. Something that you taught me very early on with yoga is that the pose that you're in currently and the pose that you're going to get into next are important, but there, there's also an importance to the space in between. And going from one pose to the next is just as important as being in that pose when you're there. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. And I guess it goes back to that kind of that stepping stone analogy where it's about, it's about the journey, you know, it's about the journey and not so much about the destination. And you can certainly set a goal or have an intention and, and, and want to pursue that and, and achieve something, for example. And that's great. It's always to have your eyes set on something that, that you can work towards. But I think the real lessons lessons in life come with the steps that you took to get there. You know, all the all the ups, all the successes, all the accomplishments. You know, the degrees, the 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 things that you learned, all of that, and you know, all the stumbling, all the falling, all the failures. You know, all of that goes right into the mix um, when you're pursuing that goal. So I think so. I look at yoga in the same way. You know when you step onto the yoga mat, especially for the first time, don't expect to be perfect, you know, expect to have to work, expect to fall, expect to not understand and be okay with that. That's just part of the process. And, and just watch your journey because yoga is certainly a journey. And that's why they call it a practice. You know, it's, it's something that you're always practicing. It's something that you're always doing, not necessarily to perfect, but to keep the path, you know, open so that you can, so you can take the next step to learn more about yourself, to learn about life and, and, and even just create the clear path that you want so that you can reach your, your goal. So that's how I approach yoga. That's how I teach yoga. Could you please go back like 15 to 20 years and tell past Casey that lesson? <laughs> 
(laughs) (laughs) It's just so, it's so wise. And I've spent most of my life just checking boxes and looking forward to the next thing and not appreciating what is going on right now. I hear you with that. And I think that's the one thing that yoga is, has really taught me and, and what I try to teach my students is that, you know, yoga allows you to be fully present and in the moment because you have to, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to your breathing. You have to pay attention to your body in motion or in stillness and you, and it pushes away all these other distractions. And then we have plenty of distractions. That's for sure. That can get in the way. And so yoga allows you to be in the moment and perhaps enjoy the moment. You know, it, 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 it may also be a, a moment of, wow, this doesn't feel great. I don't like this, or I don't like the situation that I'm currently in. Hmm, but you know what? I don't really have to stay here. I can change this. I have the power to do that, <laughs> you know? So, so it's about presence and understanding um, how important it is to yeah, cherish that moment, whether it's a highlight or a low light, that it's a it's an indicator of you know of who you are and, and maybe who you want to become. I think that's so important. I think there's value to knowing this is uncomfortable and I can change things. And also I think there's an incredible amount of power to learning that this is uncomfortable and it's okay. I can sit with this. Yes. And that's important. And another piece to this is, is um, you know, I think in today's world, we might say something like, you know, don't take life too seriously and um, don't sweat the small stuff, you know, that, that kind of thing. But, but yoga really does teach us that. It teaches us to, um, to acknowledge the moment and to, really see how we can have power and not have the situation overpower us that we, you know, we are in control and some, some out external, you know, situations don't have to direct our lives necessarily. They can certainly teach us about some things about ourselves and maybe our next step, but they don't have to be overwhelming that they cripple us, you know, that they might be, indicators of, you know, I can, I can be in control of this. I am in control of this and to see your own power. And that's, that's what I really tried to promote in my teaching practice. And even with my, my brand, my embody brand, I, I think that's what I try to highlight the most uh, with my whole brand. It's teaching folks to see their highest potential in whatever form that might be. And, and, and living in that light. I think that's an amazing message. Um, can you describe the mind-body connection? The mind-body connection. It, it, yoga, but you know, I, I think I had a benefit because I, I learned about and, and practiced psychology for a number of years before I started doing yoga and teaching yoga. So I think I have a little bit of an advantage um, in that regard as far as mind-body connection. But I do believe yoga really helped um, bring it to light in a, in a more personal way, I think, for me. But this mind-body connection is really about um, using yoga or really just using your body as an access point to understanding how you think and how you feel and what you think and what you feel. Um, and in yoga, typically people go into yoga to, it's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm stiff. I'm, I want to stretch out my hamstrings or you know, something like that. I can't bend over to touch my toes or things like that. So, oh, I should, t- I should do yoga because yoga does that. Yoga makes me flexible. And so it's a very physical thing. It can be a very physical thing. And that's the access point, you know, to know our bodies, to know, okay, here's my shoulders, here's my back, here's my legs. But the more that you do it, the more that you kind of get into this physical practice, like I said, it it helps you to push away all the distractions that, you know, all the things that are going on outside of us so you can tune into what's going on inside of you. And it starts with that physicality. And then that physicality begins to get fine-tuned. You know, you may notice, you know, your stiff back, but you might also notice 
oh, you know, this, that pain or that sensation kind of runs down my hamstrings or it feels like this and not like this. You begin to give better descriptions of what it is and how it feels, things like that. So all the subtleties and the fine tuning of all of these sensations. And then you begin to realize how it affects your mind. You start, you start to think about it. It's like, oh, you know, when my back hurts, I'm cranky, <laughs> you know, or you know what, when my legs feel like I can just run for miles, you know, I feel great. I mean, I think that's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a basic, you know, analogy there, but that's it. It just gives you access to um, how you might be thinking and how you're feeling. And the more that you do it, whether, it, you know, this yoga thing, you know, it's, it's almost magical to me, you know, it just, it just keeps you so in tuned with those subtleties. And it also then gives you that power, I think, to um, start to shift. Let's say you're anxious or you're depressed or just sad or something like that, knowing that, you know what, this access point I have with my body can actually probably make me feel better so I don't feel as depressed or I can not feel as you know anxious. I can feel you know calm and at ease just because I went to my yoga practice and it made me feel better. You know, that's kind of the cut and dried. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a simple concept on the, on the surface, but it has so much depth to it. Yeah. That's really interesting. I totally agree. I really noticed um, the way that feeling spilled over into other physical activities for me, like a, a, a long, difficult climb on my bike or, lifting weights where there was a really intense burning or intense pain and being able to sit with it and be okay with it while it was there. That's how I really noticed yoga had carried over into other areas of my life. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the, the magic I think of it. It's not just practicing yoga on the mat, you know, not just going to a yoga studio or yoga class and you get on your mat and you do your thing and you leave it behind. No, it's a practice. You're practicing life on the mat in the studio. And then you go out and live life and you realize, oh, you know what? The stuff that I learned in that yoga class last week, hey, it's applicable right now in this moment while I'm on, you know, while I'm bike riding or lifting weights or cooking dinner or what, brushing my teeth. You know, it's, it slips into every moment in our lives if we allow it. It's amazing. So if you could tell our guests how they can get started in a yoga practice because it can be very intimidating. And so I'm wondering like the, the steps to get started, obviously you have to go to a boutique shop. You have to buy the expensive yoga pants, make sure they match. You need to make sure you have the mat and all the accessories. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the process of getting into yoga? Yes. You need your matching outfits and they, you have to get to the most expensive yoga mat. Yep. And obviously, and obviously, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's great about yoga, we're joking, but you know, the greatest thing about yoga is that you can, you can do it anywhere. You know, you might go to a yoga studio, um, but because of, you know, technology nowadays, Hey, you can just practice at home. Just turn on YouTube and, you know, find some videos that you can watch. Right. Um, so I think we have greater access to the practice, which is great. Um, but I think what it is, it's just, it's just showing up just as you are. Because I think some people, especially when they come to me or to my classes or do private lessons with me, they think they have to you know, be in great shape and already flexible. It's like, no, don't worry about that. Just show up exactly as you are. If you have a desire to practice, let's just jump into it. So that, I think that's the first thing. Don't feel intimidated by having to look a certain way um, or feel a certain way. If you just have a, a curiosity about the practice, then that's, that's a door open. Go ahead and do it. Do you need the expensive yoga clothes? No, just throw on some shorts and a t-shirt, something comfortable that you can move in. Do you need a yoga mat? Not necessarily. They come in handy and you can get them pretty cheap, you know, 15 bucks, maybe 10 bucks. Someone, maybe someone will gift you one, you know, you don't need a whole lot. And, but I think it's just, it, it, it boils down to just give it a try. 
just give it a try. Show up. Just show up. You know, because it, it's the, the basics in yoga are about breathing, tuning into your breath and some movement of your body. Basics. And it, and it really just kind of starts from there. And you'll learn quite a bit if you just keep going. It's a, it's a practice that teaches you patience. It's about consistency and persistence. Because and, and, it's, and it's naturally, if you allow it, it's naturally um, motivating. It's naturally um, a process that you want to go back to. It's like, oh, I like that. You know, it's reinforcing. It's like, oh, I like that. I'm going to do that again, you know. So as best as you can, let all those funny thoughts, you know, in your mind about yoga, just push them aside. Um, throw on some sweats, you know. Get on the carpet, turn on turn on a video, and try it. That's great. That's amazing advice. Um, I think that's great. You and I were talking um, before we started recording about just starting. Just just do something. Give it a start. And you're right. If it's the right thing for you, and if it feels good, you might do it again, and then you, you might, might do, do it, it again. again. Yep. I think that's amazing. Um, well, this has already been really great information. Let's take a little break um, and come back in a few minutes. Great. All right. Well, that was really only a few seconds, not really a few minutes. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, <laughs> I want to shift gears a little bit here, and I want to talk to you about your writing. How did you become such a prolific writer? Well, I don't know if I would call myself a prolific writer, but... <laughs> I, I would. <laughs> I would. It, you write a lot. <laughs> I, I do write a lot. Lately, I have been writing a lot. Um, but it, it, it's something that I didn't think would show up in my, you know, repertoire, really. And it's funny because now, you know, my mother, she, she for, for the longest time, even before I re even started writing, you know, she because she, she she marvels, at, she, she even marvels at my life. She goes, John, you've done so much. You need to write a book, you know. And, and when I heard that, it just sounded intimidating. It just sounded like the scariest thing to do. Like, I can't write a book. And... <laughs> like and write a book about myself what <laughs> I don't know and so I just let it just kind of go in the back of my mind but this is how I got into writing um because I think that notion really just kind of stayed in my head in some capacity and I thought well maybe I do want to write about yoga because it's something that I like and maybe I can write about some of the things that I'm pursuing and doing with yoga but then I thought, well, how do you just sit down and write a book? <laughs> and probably a lot of people think that, well, yeah, how do you just sit down and write a book? I mean, that's what you do, right? You just sit down and a book comes out and you're done. And then you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da. And, and that's what you wish, I think. But I, you know, I thought, well, how do I do this? You know, what, what is it that's going to kind of get me started and going and doing and staying motivated to continue writing? And so this was my process. And this was this was a long time ago, um, and I remember thinking, I said maybe I should write a blog. And when, even when I thought about that, the the next thought was, "Ugh, I don't want to write a blog. I don't like blogs." <laughs> 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 and but it seemed like just the ones that I came across at that time. This is when blogs were kind of new at the time, you know. I thought, well, you know, people are doing these weekly blogs or daily blogs or something, and, and they were short and to the point. And I thought, well, maybe if I started writing a blog that I would post, that would give me motivation to write. And so that's exactly what I did. I said, okay, this, I, have a, I have an end goal in, in, in mind, but I'm going to have to do it through something that I'm, I'm not all that keen about, but it seems like a good process. And I think I can do this. And so each week I was determined to write just a short article about yoga. 
and how yoga can be influential in your everyday life. And so that was my blog. Um, and I wrote something every week. And so, and I got into a good routine of doing that. And so there's 52 weeks in the year. <laughs> and so I had <laughs> all these articles, but I kept going. I kept writing. And I had nearly two years worth of blog posts. And, and that became the content for my first book. I, all I did then was, I think, now I've got stuff. The, the content is written. Now all I have to do is just basically organize it. And so I just went back through all the articles, and that took some time too, to you know, kind of categorize things. Like here's, here's, here's articles about poses. Here's yoga, or here's articles about history. Here's articles about this, that, or the other. And just categorize things. And, and those turned into chapters. And so I had a, so I had a process. And the, and the funny thing is I really didn't have any, any outside help with any of that. I just thought, well, this is, this is what's going to work for me. I'll just do it. And even when I was writing the blog, Casey, I, 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 it was public and people could read it, but I didn't really care who wrote, who read it. <laughs> my, that, Cause that wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't really to get people to read my blog. My goal was to get content written. <laughs> You are reading my mind because I've heard you say that before. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you is your, your goal with your writing wasn't necessarily, you know, if people read it great, if they didn't great, but you did it for your own benefit to get through that process. Yeah. And, and it took, I'll have to say it took about five, five and a half years to do all of that. It took a long time to do. And because there were certainly moments when I wasn't writing and I was pr probably a good, it was a good chunk of time when I wasn't writing and I wasn't editing. I wasn't doing anything. I got so involved with other things that it got put on the back burner, you know, but then I said, okay, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. And so I came back to it, you know, but it took five, six years before I was able to get it done. And by that time, you know, five or six years later, we were at a point, you know, in this this techno technological advancement where you can self-publish. And so that's that's how I published. I kind of went through the Amazon Kindle, you know, um, route and was able to self-publish. And which is a great way to write a book. Because they, they kind of walk you right through the whole process. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Um, I have always enjoyed writing and have done you know, different emails and haven't necessarily done a blog until recently. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing where, where I have given myself a goal that by Wednesday at 8 AM, I need to have a blog scheduled to be released. And every Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, I start to feel this kind of pressure, um, that I would describe as resistance, just as the way the book, uh, The War of Art does. How do you overcome the resistance to create something new? It could be writing, it could be podcasting, it could be writing a book, it could be getting on the yoga mat when you don't really feel like it. How do you overcome the feeling of, ah, I, I, I can do this later, I don't wanna do this right now, that, that resistance that we feel to be better than we currently are? Right. I can certainly relate to that. And because I, you know, I, I, I find myself pushing myself back, you know, at times and with that same resistance, like, oh, I can do that later or, oh, I don't feel like it or some kind of excuse. And it's just all in my head. And I have to remember that that's just all rhetoric in my own head. No one's telling me this. It's me. Right. And so this is what you might laugh at this, but this is what I literally do. And this is in, mo in most situations, even down to the basic stuff like, you know, wash the dishes, you know, <laughs> just basic stuff, get laundry done. It's like, who wants to do laundry? No one wants to do laundry, right? And so I literally, Casey, I have to say out loud, I say, John Cottrell, just do it. And, and that somehow for me has become this mantra 
of, you know, just to break out of that shell, to get out of my own head, you know, to say, John, it's not a big deal. Just do it. Just wash the dishes. Just throw the dang dirty clothes in the laundry and turn it on. It's not going to take that long. And so I have to approach even the daunting things or what I think is daunting, like writing a book. I have to break it down into small steps. You know, it's just open the computer, <laughs> open the program and start pecking away. Even if I only get a few words out, right? Or a sentence or two. To me, that's progress. Even if, you know, I don't get much out there, I've done something. And then, and I have to praise myself for that. I congratulate myself for that, for having, taking those few minutes to open the computer, to start writing. And, and even though it may not be a whole lot at that time, if I do that every day or every week or whatever your timeline is, hey, at the end of that timeline, you've got something. So that's how I have to approach resistance. It's, I've got to get out of my own head. And I do that by literally saying out loud, John Cottrell. I have to say my whole name. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know you're really in trouble. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's kind of like, John, you're in trouble, you know, or John, listen, pay attention. It's not a big deal. Just do it. I'm like, oh, okay. You know. Yeah. I think that's such great advice and so wise. I noticed that with my meditation practice where, you know, it's, it's 10 minutes one day that's not really life changing or anything, but after, you know, a few days and a few weeks and a few months, all of a sudden you've, you've done some work and that, that shows up and really makes a difference. Absolutely. Um, I love how approachable and shareable your blogs are. I think there's a lot of content out there that is amazing and profound, but unless you're an expert in that field, you probably won't understand the writing itself. And your blogs, again, are very approachable. They're easy to understand. You don't have to be a yogi master to understand them. And there's one in particular where you wrote about this year, 2020, and the challenges that it can present. Can you elaborate on what you tried to communicate in that blog? And can you give our listeners some tips that they can take away in this tumultuous year that can benefit them? Sure. You know, in the last couple of years, and I didn't mention this, the last couple of years, I've continued the, the blog writing and, um, and have put myself out there as kind of a freelance writer and blogger for other people. Um, and so that's kind of a motivator for me to actually sit down and write <laughs> because that I'm being hired to write. And so, um, that 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 article actually was was um, a suggestion by one of my clients because they wanted a series of of blog posts that addressed what's happening in 2020, and that was one of the topics. But of course, you know, I got to you know explore what that might mean. Um, but I wanted to keep it simple that it didn't have to be, you know, too profound as far as what someone could do you know, the simpler, the better. I want people to have a success. You know, and that's part of my brand and, and what my message to people is. One, you know, seek and find your highest self. But in order to do that, keep it simple. Keep it simple. And, and that simplicity is really just kind of paying attention to, well, what do you like? You know, what do you like to do? What makes you happy? What makes you happy? And, and do those things that make you happy or be around those people that make you laugh and smile. It's as simple as that. So like when, as people were sheltering in place and things like that, you know, stay connected. If, 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 if you thrived on being around people, um, you know, what other ways could you do that, you know? FaceTime and, and, and all these kind of in, in, in Skype and Zoom and all these ways that you can connect, all, although digitally, you know, connect with friends, with people you haven't seen in a long time, even people around the world, across the country. So start with something simple, but with something that you enjoy, something that makes you happy. 
when it comes to kind of the yoga world, same thing. You don't have to get in there and think you have to be an expert at the yoga practice. It starts with the basics. And what I would suggest to people is, you know, learn about breathing. T pay attention to your breathing. Because that's really, for me at least, is the foundation of all yoga is because it's, it's a physical thing, but it's something that we don't pay much attention to, our breath. But when you do, it can be pretty profound. It makes you be much more aware of yourself, about how you're feeling, how you're thinking. It has a very calming effect. It's, a, it's very healing. And so that would be my, my suggestion is in regards to how to approach just the overwhelmingness of 2020, you know, finding time, even if it's just a couple of minutes, not that you need to carve out an hour, you know, cause you may not, that sounds, you know, intimidating enough, you know, to sit and meditate. It's like, ah, that sounds too scary, but take a couple minutes, sit in your comfort, uh, on a, in a comfortable chair or sofa, close your eyes, breathe, just pay attention to your breathing. Don't know how to do that. Turn on some nice music that you like. Not into that. Maybe you you've been start. You wanted to read a novel or read this book or a magazine article about your you know about uh, your favorite traveling places. Sit and read for a few minutes. It's it's those small simple things because they're grounding. They keep you fully rooted and connected, so that you can then manage a little bit better some of the chaos that's going on around us. That is beautiful advice. Really wonderful. Um, it's, it's amazing how simple that sounds and yet how easily we we forget that. And it could be so much easier to remember and re-implement those things in our lives. Absolutely. It is that simple. And just to reiterate, it's just find something that you really like. You know, it might be photography or it's cooking or baking or uh, running or just something that you enjoy. And then, and then carve out some time to do that. It may take a few minutes, but it might even turn into, you know, a full day of that or whatever it is for you. Um, it's, it, it starts that simply. That's amazing. Um, let's take a little break and we will get to our final segment. So speaking of things that we really like, I have to ask you, before all the madness of 2020 started, you had um, been posting pretty much my favorite part of any social media that I've ever seen. You were going on a hamburger tour all over the city. That was amazing. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience and some of the some of the great burgers you've eaten? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. Um... <laughs> I do love burgers. <laughs> <Why? I> do. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, that kind of goes right to the point of, you know, what do you love? I love bacon cheeseburgers, you know? <laughs> Man and of my so, own heart. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I kind of pride myself when I, you know, would go to a restaurant, any restaurant, I'll go to an Italian restaurant. Do you have bacon cheeseburgers? <laughs> <laughs> if it's on the menu, I'm going to get it. That's amazing. And if it's a great one, you know, it's, you know, it gets chalked up on my list. Right. That's great. And so, and so I have a buddy who, you know, loves them just as much as I do. And so we just started, you know, it was just, it was a way to kind of break up our own routines. I was like, man, we got to hang out. And so let's do something that we like. Let's go, let's just go get a burger, you know, and try new places. And so we started doing that, right? And people started hearing about it. And they said, you guys should write reviews <laughs> <laughs> on the burger places that you go to. And so that's how that got inspired. <laughs> that's amazing. It so really we started was. going to different places when, you know, people would give us suggestions and we had this whole long list 
And, um, and so we just started going to these places and trying them out and we had created a little rating system and, and we wrote about it. (laughs) (laughs) Which one was your favorite? If you had to pick one out. So my, my favorite to this day in it, um, is Lucky 13. It's in Salt Lake City. Yes. And Lucky 13 actually is a bar, um, but they the, but they serve great burgers. They have wonderful burgers on their menu. And um, they they've remained my favorite. There's some there's some other really good ones in town, but I keep coming back to that. And actually, I <laughs> we're going next week. I've got I've got plans to go next week. <laughs> to go back to lucky 13 because you can sit out on the patio i'm gonna go awesome. to do, do that before it gets too cold that's awesome but lucky 13 yeah okay well before you hold out um your judgment on your favorite burger i'm going to have to give you one of our house smashed um grilled onion peanut butter burgers oh my gosh i'm, I'm already drooling <laughs> i'll have to bring you one um so a few months ago i gave you a call Um, I was just kind of in the middle of starting, um, boundless body with my wife, Bethany, and I felt like you were a good resource to talk to because you seem to have the same kinds of values that we have in our business. We want to provide a lot of value and help as many people as we possibly can. Um, and you gave me some really great advice. I had been reading a lot of business books and entrepreneur books and you you told me that that you just kind of do your own thing. You don't necessarily do things the way this guy says he does it in his book or that person says they do it in their podcast. You just kind of went your own way. Can you can you tell me a little bit about that? I think gosh, how do I approach that one? Because I certainly did a little homework, I guess but mainly in a way to get inspired and just to see how other people kind of did their thing. And it, and it, and inspiration for me, you know, it comes in the form of kind of like what I talked about earlier. Does it, does it feel good? Does it make me happy? You know, and does it motivate me to a place where, you know, I can say I can do that or I want to do that. Right. And so I think that's, that's what happened for me you know, just kind of seeing what was going on around me at that time and, uh, and being inspired by it. But I've had some other inspiration too. And, and, and I have to say, you know, yoga was a big piece of that. And I keep coming back to yoga because it, it really did give me some clarity about, you know, where I was presently in my, in my life before I made a shift and started my own business because it made me realize that I feel stuck. I feel like, okay, I've done what I've needed to do in this particular moment, and now I'm ready to move on because I have a lot of ideas. And I think that's a little bit of, about myself too. I just, my mind is always going and so many new ideas just keep popping up. Um, and so I wanted, instead of having all that stuff just bottled up, I wanted to try it. And just kind of get out there and just do it. And and I know it's not very specific, but I just followed that lead of my mind saying, John, it sounds, you know, like you want to do this. So why not? Give it a try. I think it's it's so challenging to know when you need to stop getting external information. And when to trust your own intuition and just start to go with that. You're right. It, it can be tough. It's like, when do you make that switch? When do you cross that line? You know, when do you make that shift? And, and you always, and I think what gets in the way, and it's part of that resistance, you know, we think we have to create the perfect conditions, just like going to yoga for the first time. You think you have to, per- have, to have the perfect yoga clothes and the perfect yoga mat before you can go, Right. But no, you just, just go, you know, just start just like starting this podcast or starting to write a book, just try it and just see what it feels like. Make the mistakes, stumble, fall, because we can always learn from that. It's like, okay, well that worked. 
let me, you know, let me hang on to that part because that worked. But this part over here, I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. I'm not going to, that doesn't make me happy or that didn't feel right. So I'm not sure if that's going to fit in the, in this progression that I'm trying to make. Um, and, and being okay with all of that. One thing I think we learn, we can learn with yoga is that nothing's permanent. Things are fluid. And if we can, if we're able to kind of ride the wave, you know, especially now, you know, if you can ride this wave, you can become a pretty pro surfer, you know, um, as long as you've got, you know, those things that ground you, you know, good people, positive people in your life that you feel good about yourself and who you are, even if you don't, you know, that, that you, but th there's certainly things that make you happy or there's things that you enjoy doing. Those are your, those are foundational because if you fail or feel like you didn't make the steps or get to the end, end point of what you wanted, that's okay. You can always come back to the things you love. Go back to the bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> I will. All else fails. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your company. So my company is Embody, and it's the letter M, B O D Y, Embody. And if you just say Embody, it's like to embody, to become something. Um, and so it started as a it it was it wasn't my company. It was just basically a, a, a word or a, not even a brand really, but it was something that I called um, one of my moving classes, one of my dance classes. And I just called it embody. And, um, but as, as things kind of progressed uh, for me, it, it turned into something. And like I said, I had a very significant um, shift in my life. And this was, this was around the time when I, first, you know, when I met you and, it was in, and, and knew you quite well, that I went through a pretty significant shift in my own life. I went on a trip and I, this trip was to Peru and it was pretty eye-opening in a very spiritual way, in a very profound way that it literally, it, it changed my life. It, it, it opened my eyes because at that point I was feeling pretty stuck. I was feeling like, I, I think I've kind of met the end of what I can do where I am now and I'm ready to pursue something else. And, and what I wanted to do, this the ideas that were running through my head, it's like, I want to broaden my my yoga practice, my teaching practice. I had discovered that, oh, yoga doesn't always come in the form of classes and groups. Yoga can be done one-on-one. -on -one. And that really fit with my psychology and what I was doing previous to yoga. And so, hmm, what if I became, you know, what I called at the time, a yoga life coach and worked with individuals? That's what I want to do. And, ooh, I can do workshops and training. So it just kind of kept evolving. And so when I um, decided to pursue what I you know, wanted to do at that time, I thought, what can I call this? And I just called it Embody, Embody. And it was yoga classes, private lessons, uh, life, yoga life coaching, retreats, workshops. That's what it started out as, but then it evolved. And, it, and I turned it into, I guess, a brand, you know? And that brand, as I mentioned, is to tap into your own strengths and talents to reach your highest potential. But start simply and take it step by step. Start small. And, and you can do that by coming to yoga, for example, and learning about your breath, learning about your body. And if you learn about those two things, you're going to learn some pretty profound things about yourself. So that's how Embody evolved in, or, you know, in, its, in its early stages. And it continues to evolve. Where do you foresee your company going in the future? Now that we're in kind of in this tech age, because you know, you know, I certainly was teaching a lot of you know, classes and doing workshops and trainings and, and, and doing retreats you know, all over the place. But that's, you know, kind of come to a standstill at the moment, but we still have the internet. And so I've been creating as much content as I can, just recording and videoing um, yoga 
tutorials and classes and things like that so that I can put out there so people can see it. Um, and, and it's inspired people. I've been approached by some elementary schools, you know, schools that either are doing uh, in-person uh, classes or teaching from home. They needed, you know, activities, PE. And so they found some of my yoga tutorials because they were easy to understand <laughs> and that kids could do it. And so, so things like that. Um, I want to continue doing that. I'm going to do an online yoga teacher training, do some more workshops. I've done a couple of online yoga workshops, um, teaching virtually, still doing that. So I'll just continue with that until the next thing arises. I would hopefully eventually I can continue doing retreats and workshops, you know, outside of my own house. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Oh man, I wish you could see my face. As soon as you mentioned yoga and children, just the, the smile on my face, that makes me so, so happy. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, before we let you go, we are going to let you in on our tradition. Bethany and I started this um, a few weeks ago, where at the end of the week, we would ask each other what we called the three questions. And they were based on the time frame of one week, um, which is to say that we want to have guests on that are always pushing and always learning and always discovering new things about them that they can identify some of these things every single week in their life. And so the first question I'm going to ask you is what is one thing this week that you have learned or that you have changed your mind about? Oh, wow. That's great. I love, I love those three questions or the questions. Um, so that one, huh? You know, I've been listening to, um, Reverend Al Sharpton's new book um, on Audible. It's called Rise Up, uh, Confronting a Country at the Crossroads is the name of it. And because I've been seeing, you know, I've seen, I've been watching him just kind of pop up in the news, you know, all the time. But but it's, it's funny seeing him on TV in this capacity because that's not how I knew Reverend Al Sharpton because he has a history. And because he was in the entertainment world like with, you know, James Brown and, and some boxers and things like that. So he was kind of this over the top kind of guy that was in media. And, and to, so to see him in, in this realm talking very politically, he has, he has a, a political show and all of that is a little odd at first, but, but he's got something to say and I really like hearing him. And so he has this new book and um, I just started listening to it. Um, and he has his own perspective on, the current president, because he used to, because he knew him, um, you know, years ago, <laughs> you know, he knew early Trump, and he knows him now. And just to hear his perspective is, is pretty eye opening. But I also have grown to appreciate um, what he's gone through, uh, Al Sharpton, in, in the last, you know, 40, 50 years, as far as um, um, racial equality, uh, uh, equality for women, the LGBT community. He's very open and very open-minded. And it's probably because of his background. And it's, it's, and it's refreshing. It's really refreshing to, to, to hear that, knowing that he really did make a shift in his own life um, and had his own woke moments and is now quite political and I like what he has to say. And it's something that I can, I think I can relate to. So that's, so in a way I learned and he's changed my mind about some things. That's great. I have a few audible credits available to me. So that is going to get downloaded. I appreciate that. Um, question number two, what is one thing in this past week that you wish you had done better? You know, sometimes I can get pretty self-critical, <laughs> you know, because even though I stay pretty productive and, and do th things, um, I, I sometimes think I'm pretty lazy. <laughs> that, might sound, that, that might sound funny because I, like, I love TV. I love sitting in front of the TV and watching my shows. <laughs> and, so some, and so sometimes I'm sitting there and it could be a long time sitting on that couch in front of the TV and thinking to myself, Shoot, you're lazy. You should be up doing something. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do plenty. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what people say. <laughs> 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 uh, 
but they don't see me sitting on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, cat's out of the bag now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have to catch myself um, to, to, to not degrade myself, you know, in that way um, that I know I'm productive and I, I love what I do. And I, I get such a joy in what I do and how I use the time in my day. And I take pride even in that, that reward moment when I get to plop down on the couch in my sweats and turn on my trash TV, you know? <laughs> and so I have to be, I just have to be careful with that, not to, you know, to put myself down, you know, when I give myself that time for myself. That's great. The final question, what is one thing that you've done in the past week that you are very proud of? <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, I can think of two things. Can I say, can I say two? Absolutely. <laughs> um, um, another thing that makes me happy and it's, and it's, it's a joy to me. I like to cook and I like to bake. And, um, this this week, actually yesterday, in fact, I'm perfecting my my oven baked French fries. Oh man! Yeah, and when when you're making your your burgers, and so I've been getting I've been getting burgers, and I've been grilling my burgers at home, and and just you know because you, you can put anything on them, right? So you just you know put all the toppings that you want on them, but you got to have fries, right? Absolutely. And so I'm per so I'm perfecting the oven baked fries. Doesn't take a lot of oil. You can season them great. They're crispy on the outside, soft and fluffy on the inside. Just the perfect French fry. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm drooling. <laughs> sounds amazing. And my new baking item, because it's um, uh, we're in you know the uh, the fall season. We're getting close to Halloween and and uh, Thanksgiving. Here's here's one more thing. I don't know if you know about know this about me. Um, I have another website, you know, that's not yoga. Do you know this? No, I didn't it's know called, this. It's called One Cake Wonder. OneCakeWonder.com. Look it up right now. That's OneCakeWonder.com. <laughs> I like to bake pound cakes. Wow. And so I got inspired to to because people, you know, I like baking them and I would just eat them all by myself. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course. I, no, I share. I do share them. But people said, you should, you, you should sell your cakes. Would you, you know, would you sell your cakes? I'm like, sure, why not? And so I created a website like five or six years ago. Cool. And so you, if you go online, you can buy a custom ordered uh, pound cake. So my latest is, and I just posted it yesterday, um, is... The, the small pumpkin patch. And what it is, it's, uh, it's a pumpkin spice cake, but they're in the shape of pumpkins. So if you look on the website, you'll, you'll see it's on the front page. Um, they look like little pumpkins, those little pumpkins, those, um, I think they call them princess pumpkins, but they're cakes. Wow, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> I felt like I did enough research um, before getting into this, but I did not know that. <laughs> so that's one one cake wonder .com. <laughs> that's great um besides the cake what's something you want uh people to walk away from this conversation with uh i i would say find your passion find your passion what is it that makes you happy or those things make a list those things that make you that make you happy make you smile make you laugh you know, feel like a kid again. You know, I think that's so important because that can be the foundation for so much. It could be the foundation for getting through, you know, these tumultual times. It could be the foundation for, you know, achieving that goal you've been wanting to do. Um, to just to 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 feel like the better a better to create a better form of yourself, and it can start with something that simple as. Um, embracing your passion, doing exactly what you love doing. That is absolutely beautiful advice. John, I have to say, I've known you for a long time. Um, this, this has been one of the most meaningful and important conversations I've ever heard, let alone been able to be a part of. Um, I'm absolutely honored that you um, were able to come on and be our first guest. I'm so grateful for you. 
where can people go to find you and connect with you? Well, let me just say, it's been a pleasure, Casey. This has been wonderful, even you know, after all these years and just being able to stay connected and just watching your journey and just seeing you just take the steps that you and Bethany are taking with this this new project. It's fantastic. And, and just knowing that, you know, you know, you're certainly growing as an individual, but you're also influencing and helping, you know, other people, which, and that's something you both have always done. So I'm honored. Um, so people can find me at onecakewonder.com. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's one place. <laughs> I'm going there. I'll go there to find you. <laughs> You can also find me. I've got I've got all kinds of websites, but probably the easiest one. It's my it's it's embody.org, and that's one way that people can actually schedule an appointment with me to do a private yoga therapy session, for example, or johncatrell.com, which I just I just call that my 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 hub. I basically basically it's just the hub of just of everything John Cottrell in the yoga world, whether it's my books or blog posts and um, writings and retreats and classes. That's the place to go. So johncottrell.com. johncottrell.com. That sounds great. Um, thank you again for appearing on the show. We're, we're, again, just so grateful to hear your insights and your wisdom. Um, I hope a lot of people are touched by this and can take your wisdom and apply it into their lives. So thank you again. We're very grateful. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Boundless Body Radio. We'll see you soon.